Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. This is the Manchester Java community. Uh, my name's Nick Ebbett. I help organise the event. Um, we've got Debbie Roycroft on as well, who also helps. Um, yeah, so uh, these meetups, uh, basically we run them over lunchtime. We kind of call them the JVM lunch. Um, today's kind of not really related to the JVM, so we've got a nice kind of twist. Um, we're going to explore some slightly different content, which will be uh, useful. I won't talk too much about that, because that's Helen's, uh, Helen's job. But yeah, I think um, thanks for coming. Um, and I'll just hand over to Helen. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. All right, let's see if the technology is going to behave. Of course it is, because you know, if we started, everything's going to be perfect now. Uh, is that even sharing the right screen? Yeah, I think so. It is. Good. OK, it's, it's like you, you can't see my speaker thing. notes, it must be sharing the right screen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the benefit of everybody else, the reason I ask that is I'm currently really paranoid because I made the mistake of thinking my Mac's going really slow. So I'll just restart it right before I'm about to give this presentation because nothing ever goes wrong with that as a plan. And then my Mac decided to install some updates and I panicked and yeah, there you go, you're up to speed. Um, so welcome to my talk today. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for giving up your lunch. And if you are busy eating, Good, kudos to you. Um, so I'm gonna be talking to you today about hacks for content creation and sharing. So I put this talk together off the back of a blog post that I wrote uh, for creating content because I started to create content or technical content personally about a year, 18 months ago now. I've done it professionally before that uh, for many years uh, under the guise of technical writing. But the thing with technical writing is you'll never, you never really own your content. It's more product content and people who consume it have no idea that you wrote it. So content creation, I know, is something that I've always loved, but I've always been behind a, a kind of firewall, if you like, in that it's not directly linked to me until now. So I started creating the content um, personally and then professionally as well, because I've recently, well, seven months ago, I joined JetBrains as a Java developer advocate. So part of that as well has been, as you would expect, content creation for the community. So I'm going to be going through a bunch of hacks. But before I do that, just set your expectations. I'm expecting this talk to run for around 30 minutes. Um, if I go insanely fast, it may be 25 minutes. So there should be time for questions at the end. Um, yeah, with that, I shall get started. So before I go into the hacks, uh, benefits, I just want to touch on briefly for creating your content. Um, I think a lot of you know these innately because they're kind of drilled into us, especially in the careers that most of us are in. But uh, creating content, it really helps you to learn stuff. It helps you to cement knowledge and it helps you to learn and grow. Um, mostly it helps you to grow because you can then share that content and you can normally you share it within a community and that community can be anything from the Manchester Java community that's for here um, right up to tech Twitter. I have no, no idea even how big that is or how to define it. But once you create content, you share it within a community and that snowballs over time, right? You, you build, you share, you create. It really helps to validate other people's experiences as well. And you will all know this from Stack Overflow. Everybody in this call, I expect, has had a problem and they've Googled it and Stack Overflow has gone, here's 20 answers to your problem. And only one of those answers is going to be your exact operating system, your exact error, your exact problem, your exact exception and steps that you yourself can follow to solve that. So by creating content, you really do help to validate other people's experiences. It can also help you to meet people within the community. And this is something, again, that I'm particularly passionate about because of my own experiences. But what you know is great, right? What you know is super freaking useful. But who you know is really good as well. And the reason is because those people often see different skill sets that you may not be demonstrating in your day-to-day -day job. Right? If your day-to-day -day job is Java developer, you may not necessarily get the opportunity to showcase all your other skills that you inevitably have. So opportunities within a community can lead to people offering to co-host a talk with you still working on that one um, it might be that they're willing to proofread some of your content before it goes live it might be that they're willing to even promote your content maybe they have a massive twitter following and they they, they really like your content so they retweet it so there's a lot of benefits to creating and sharing your own content 
Um, the reason your own there is in brackets is when I first gave this talk, it was all about personal content that you, you own. Um, but somebody is on this call today who said, yes, but I'm being asked to create corporate content. So how would I go about that? So there's a few hacks at the end for that, which is why I've kind of caveated that earlier on. So once you've created the content, you have to share it. And a good friend said to me, well, if you're going to create content, you have to get good at self-promotion. And I'm pretty sure this was what I said, um, because I was very uncomfortable with the notion. I couldn't quite put my finger on why I was uncomfortable with the notion. So I did what we all do when we're not comfortable with something. I Googled it. And this is what Google said. So the words that had been popping into my head when I was thinking about self-promotion were words like narcissistic, self-serving, um, words that I'm not going to say on a recorded um, talk, but none of them were good, right? They were all quite negative words. And I thought, well, if that's what I have to be, then this isn't going to work for me. So given I had to make it work for me, I went on a little journey of changing self-promotion. So self-promotion by that very definition is me, me, me. It's all about me. I'm so awesome and I'm going to shove it down your throat. That's not where we want to be with this. So moved it, just slightly shifted it across. It's not about you. It's about your stuff. So that's just a screenshot of my website. It's about content, right? It is, it's not so much about promoting me. It's about promoting my content. This for me, I thought was the full picture, but actually I've added one more piece to this slide, but came into clarity for me a few weeks ago. And it's this, it's authenticity. So we are at our most authentic when we are speaking about stuff that we know about, that we are comfortable speaking about, that we are passionate about. So I am exceptionally passionate about creating content and I am, for example, exceptionally, exceptionally passionate about the experience that new Java developers have. Why? Because that's my experience. That's where um, the most of my, my learnings come from. So that's what I'm most experienced in talking about. And that's where I can be the most authentic. So when you first start creating content, people don't come to your talk or read your blog or watch your video because it's you, unless they're your mom or your colleagues maybe. But they, they, they do that because they want to consume the content. Over time, as you build up this authenticity and you build up your brand and the kind of content that you're creating, people may then come because it's you yourself delivering the talk or writing the blog or watching the video. Maybe they click subscribe. So just to bear in mind, you're going to create the content and then you're going to share the content. But sharing the content is not about self-promotion. It's about promoting the content and yourself with authenticity. OK, that was the very brief introduction. Content hacks. Um, this talk came out of a blog post which had seven content hacks in. Unfortunately for you, I've since had time to add another 13. So these are a bunch of hacks that I have used to help me get better. And I hope in turn, they help you. Some of them are longer and shorter. So I, I still think we'll be OK on time. OK, first hack. Uh, we have to start from zero because we're programmers. Um, no one's going to read or watch it anyway. So I was really stressing about publishing my first blog some time back now. And I was having a full blown meltdown. Uh, my friend said, it's fine, Helen, don't worry about it because no one's going to read it anyway. And my first, my first re reaction was rude. And my second reaction was, she's got a point because, okay, maybe I have 10 Twitter followers and one of them is my mom. Okay, well, I'm going to make her read it. But actually it's true when you first start and you first start creating content, whether it's a blog or whether it's a video or whether it's a TikTok video, I'm too old for TikTok, but I assume. When you first start creating this content, no one's going to read or watch it anyway, right? It's, and that is completely fine. It's a really good hack to get you into the mechanical motion of create content, share content, create content, share content. The thing, the thing with this hack is it doesn't last. And the reason it doesn't last is you get adrenaline, you want more. You've put a lot of time and effort into creating your content. So you want people to consume it. So it's a good one to get started, but it doesn't last. OK, next hack, make yourself a platform. Right, there are 20 hacks in this talk. If you only take one away, make it this one. There are a number of developer advocates or content creators out there now who have content scattered across the web 
and they are now trying to regain control of that and bring it all to one central location so they can build a brand and it's really freaking hard so if you are just starting on your content creation journey you can make yourself a platform and if you don't need to go down a branding rabbit hole do not spend 500 quid on branding like i did don't do it you can pick an off-the-shelf um website builder like wix or squarespace if front end your cup of tea, you can build it yourself um, or WordPress if somewhere in between. Ideally, get yourself um, get yourself a URL and build yourself a brand. If you're not able to do that, then just pick a platform that you're going to constantly share to. So whether that's YouTube, Medium, Dev.io, other, just build yourself a brand and a platform. Use the same handle everywhere. So, for example, I try and use Helen Jo Scott on Twitter, my website, my GitHub, my LinkedIn. So you have a brand by which you are known. So don't spend ages on it, just get something up there. Another advantage of this, if you're submitting conference um, talks, abstracts, then if you're a new speaker and they've never you know, seen you speak before, they might want to look at your website and say, oh, okay, I can see that person. I can see you know, how they present and is that something that would fit with my conference? So make yourself a platform. Okay, next hack, find the medium that works for you. So here's the thing. Some people like reading. So rather, some people like writing, some people like speaking, some people like watching, and some people like listening, which means you can create blogs, you can give talks, you can create videos, or you can create podcasts. Do what works for you. I love reading blogs. I love creating blogs. I quite like creating videos. I'm dabbling in podcasts, not really sure on them at the moment but do what works for you. Don't feel like you're going to exclude part of the audience because you're not creating content for them. Your audience will find you. Okay, experience-based content. So I attended a new speaker workshop with a very talented gentleman called Steve Poole through the London Java community and RecWorks. And he said, for this speaker workshop, you need to create a five minute um, technical experience-based presentation. And I didn't listen. Oh, no, I ignored him. I created a five minute talk on the long term support releases for Java for Oracle. I couldn't tell you why I did that. Um, it was actually a really stupid thing to do because I created a talk that became binary. It was right or it was wrong. And that was it. There was no discussion. There was no validating anybody else's opinion. It was just a binary talk. So create an experience based talk or blog or video or whatever, because no one can argue with your experience. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning, people, when you create content, it really helps to validate other people's experience as well as your own. So it not just even when you're first getting started throughout your content creation career, experience based content is so incredibly valuable. Okay, regularity over size. So I have been working with a few um, few developers who are fairly new to the industry and they I hear things from them like they say, well, I've created a 3000 word blog post last Sunday, therefore I have to create a 3000 word blog post next Sunday. No, you don't. You do not have to do that. You could create a 500 word blog post next Sunday or you could create a 300 word blog post in two Sundays time. By the way, a weekly commitment for creating content is a very big commitment. So just bear that in mind. The way that we work as human beings is we would much rather consume content on a regular basis, irrespective of the size. So if you're going to put out War and Peace one week and you feel like putting out a 30 second video the next week, that's fine. You don't need to um, lure yourself into a false sense of security whereby you're constantly having to create content that is um, arguably excessive because again you people have to consume this content as well so the way you get more readers on your blog or the way you get more views on your youtube channel is regularity over size so putting content out regularly and picking a cadence that works for you and your life okay uh, next one get yourself a community mentor. So there, I wrote a blog post on this. I'm not going to go into too much detail because there is a link at the end, but there are people in the communities. There are people in the community like this that want to help you, right? They, they have walked your path. They have tripped over every single thing that you're about to trip over. 
and they are willing to help you in a number of ways, right? They might be willing to review your content. They might be willing to, like I said earlier, retweet your, your stuff. They might be willing to watch recordings of you giving a talk and give you feedback on it. That's definitely happening, by the way. Um, they might be willing to co-present with you at a conference. They might be willing to introduce you to other people. They might know of job opportunities that haven't even hit the market yet. So I would really recommend this. My personal view is no money should change, exchange hands. This is just a professional relationship that you have with somebody else in the community where you're very open, you're very honest. There is a template in the blog for how a meeting you know, should go. They want to give you a seat at the table and they exist. So I think that's a really, a really valuable point and that one's helped me immensely. I have a couple of community mentors myself. Okay, next one, don't overthink it. So I, I'm very good at this. I'm very good at overthinking everything. Uh, you will get some hits and you will get some misses. And when you're first starting to put content out there, don't worry about it. When I gave this talk at the LJC um, and I spoke to Barry afterwards, he said, yes, but what about the audience? So that kind of made me think, do consider your audience, but don't consider your audience to the exclusion of the content that you want to create. So you wouldn't create a talk on knitting and then give it a gardening conference, right? You wouldn't do that, that would be mad. But consider your audience and be upfront with what you're going to talk about or blog about or create a video about. So metrics are your friend. Remember to create content that's about experience, something you're passionate about, something you can be authentic about. and don't sweat it. Just if you don't get any hits, you don't get any hits. You'll you'll probably spend five minutes on a blog and get like 300 hits and you'll be like, what happened? You can figure that out in time. OK, next hack. Tell people you're going to do it. Um, remember, it's about the content, not you. The number of people, including myself, uh, who give talks or blogs or whatever, and then they don't put it on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever. They don't tell anybody that they're going to do it. And then when it comes to it, no one turns up and then they seem surprised. It's like, well, you didn't tell anyone. So I know it's uncomfortable. I get that it's uncomfortable, but if you're giving um, a talk and I have to give kudos to Nick because he managed to tweet it way before I got around to it. You know, I was able to retweet that and say, yes, I'm giving this talk today on Thursday and I'm really looking forward to it. So put yourself out there because it's not about you. You don't need to feel uncomfortable. It's about your talk and your content. Next hack, information density is a good thing. So my colleague, Trisha G is amazing at this. Uh, she has a talk called Beyond Java 8 and on her website, she has a ton of links to every other resource that she has ever referenced when she created that talk. And it's links to everything you could possibly imagine. So if you're creating a blog post, use links. If you're creating a video, make sure you've got a C also. If you're creating a talk, have a summary slide at the end. Give people the choice to find more information and go into more depth if they want to go into more depth, right? That's all you have to do is just give them a choice. So as much information as you can put in there, put it in. Okay, there's a little bit in this talk where we go, we go on to the heavy hacks. This is the first of the heavy hacks. Um, make the time. So I am a big believer in that time is all we have and it is incredibly precious. So all I'm saying is spend it on yourself and don't spend it all of it on Netflix. Um, I love Netflix. I can binge. I think I did Queen's Gambit in maybe two days and I'm on Stranger Things again because it's so good. But make the time to create the content. So if you are, um, if you settle your cadence to be monthly, try and set aside the time like Sunday morning or whatever you can do to to make the time. I do absolutely appreciate there are some big hitters in this department and they come in the form of children, parents, grandparents, health, commuting, not commuting. There is a huge bucket of stuff that will take your time away from you and quite rightly too. There is also a thing called life curveballs and they will get thrown at you and you will need to catch or dodge when that happens and not beat yourself up. But when you have the time, use it wisely. Okay, I told you we were into the heavy hacks. Um, don't be afraid of feedback. So this is something that, again, I've learned to get better at, but I'm definitely still on that journey. The first thing you should do, in my view, when you get feedback, unless it's abusive and horrible, 
which has never happened by the way, hopefully it won't be a first today, um, is say thank you because they, if they are giving you feedback on your content, they have given you their time, right? They have read it, they have listened to it, they have watched it, they have consumed it in some way. So they've, they've taken your content, right? That is a gift. So the first thing you can do is say thank you. And that actually can disarm quite a few conversations. The next thing you need to remember is what you do with that feedback is your choice and nobody else's. If somebody says there's a typo in your blog, you can leave it there. It doesn't matter. Or you can fix it, whatever. If someone says you talk too fast, you can slow it down or you can not. It is completely up to you how you take that feedback on board or if you don't take that feedback on board. OK, so I just want you to remember thank you and feedback is your choice. You don't need to tell the person whether you're going to take it on board or not. You just need to remember that you actually have control of that situation. OK, hack 11, uh, consider usability. This is definitely something I want to learn more about. Uh, the lowest hanging fruit here, especially when you're creating a blog, is alt tags. They cost nothing. Please put them in. It's 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 just it's such an easy win and makes such a big difference. So whatever content you're creating, I'm more on the written side, so that's kind of my tip. But whatever content you're creating, please consider usability because it really doesn't cost anything and it makes a massive difference. Credit where credit's due. Um, so I use a couple of websites to get royalty free images. I, there'll be links at the end. One is Pixabay, one is Upsplash. You don't actually have to give these people credit. But my point of view is they took that photo. I like that photo. I'm using that photo. So why wouldn't I give them credit? Right. That's just it's just polite. It's it's nice. So if some, if you've reused somebody's content or you've referenced someone's content or you've used someone's image, please make sure it's royalty free. Give them the credit. Doesn't cost anything. Right, next one. I think that's all the heavy ones over. Uh, use platforms consistently. So by platforms, I mean your Twitter, your LinkedIn, your Facebook. I don't know if Facebook counts a platform. Facebook, Instagram. I'm gonna mention TikTok again. Um, whatever platforms you use, use them consistently. So I tend to use Twitter more than LinkedIn, mostly because I can't figure LinkedIn out. Sometimes I think it's a networking worksite and sometimes I think it's trying to be Facebook. So I get very confused. So I tend to focus more on Twitter, but whatever works for you, right? And if you, if you always post your stuff on Twitter and then you want to cross post it to LinkedIn, just always do that. Just be consistent with how you're approaching the platforms and how you're using them. Five minutes. We're okay. Um, try pairing on content. So for the developers on the call um, and anybody who works in software engineering teams, you'll almost have seen developers pairing on content. And if you're like me, you might be quite jealous because as, as a technical writer, sometimes you only have yourself for company. Uh, but I found out recently that when I paired with one of my colleagues on just creating some markdown, it worked really well. Sure, it wasn't Java code, it was English. But it worked really well because we had one person navigating, one person driving, one person churning the ideas, and I was just typing them out. And then I wrote it up and it saved us so much time. So if you're feeling like you've got a bit of writer's block and chocolate and a walk hasn't helped, ring up your friend and try pairing on some content. Oh, we're back into the heavy hacks. Um, don't let language skills hold you back. So I get paranoid about this one. Uh, partly because I've got a 15 year background in technical writing. So I think that if people, or I think that if there's an error in my documentation or my content, that people will get really mad at me and say I'm rubbish. It's just not true. The typos or the odd grammar mistake in your content is not going to block it, right? No one actually cares. It's not going to make a difference. And the same goes for giving talks or writing or creating any sort of content in a language that is not your native language. I have a huge amount of respect for you. Like it is something I have English and then I have Spanglish. That's all I have on the language front. So if you are speaking another language and it's not your native language and you are worried that you're going to get judgment on your accent or whatever it is, please don't. We all have accents and they are beautiful and they are, it's part of you. So please, please don't let that hold you back. Hmm. 
my favorite. Don't listen to the voices. Um, you know the ones, they sit just here, at least mine do, and they come out with junk like you're not good enough or this isn't useful or someone's done this already or your experience isn't valid. And sometimes they just cycle around the same rubbish over and over again. You will never manage to shut them up completely. At least I have not managed it. If you manage it, then please let me know. Um, but what you can do is you can listen to the little ones on the other side and you can get them to, I take this analogy way too far. You can get them to march across the back of your neck and put these ones in a little wicker basket and sit on the lid. Whatever you have to do to just acknowledge them and say, that's nice, but shush. I strongly recommend you do that because if you listen to them, you won't get any content out. Okay, reflection time. Um, leave reflection time, it should say, but still publish it anyway. So I'm a big fan of creating content and then sleeping or in fact, that's all we can do currently. So this is going for a walk, but create, create the content, walk away and come back. Um, you will find stuff. It will, you'll think about stuff. It will reignite your passion for it. So give yourself a little bit of reflection time, but still publish it anyway. Um, because otherwise it's not good. Okay, believe in yourself. So this hack is in here because I've had to in part teach myself to do this. And I thought when I put this slide in here, I was like, well, why should I? And I decided it was because my experience is unique. My knowledge point is interesting. My viewpoint is fascinating. And I know others will benefit if I share my journey. And that's why I think, you know, you too, you should believe in yourself and believe in the content that you're creating. Okay, enjoy yourself. <laughs> there will be times that you won't, but we are humans. And unless we are being paid, we don't tend to do things that we don't enjoy. So by all means, you know, you will at times get frustrated and at times you'll publish something to Twitter and then you'll put your phone in airplane mode and run away. But on the whole, try and enjoy yourself. So that is creating and sharing your personal content. The, the message here is please don't keep it to, your to yourself. Let others know that you're here and that you have something to share. You'll benefit and they'll benefit. And it is a phenomenal addition to your professional repertoire of skills. Right, very briefly, just for you, Aurora. Um, corporate content hacks. So what if you're, cre what if you're being asked to create corporate content, right? How, how does that fit in? For those of you looking at the time, there's only five hacks, so you're okay. First one, ask about the corporate voice and brand, right? What's gone before and where are you at now? Have they got branding guidelines? What is the corporate voice? You know, if you look at the corporate voice for someone like McDonald's versus someone like PwC, they're very different. Okay, so consider what the corporate voice is because when you're creating content, it's actually quite a difficult skill to move from your voice to a corporate voice. So for example, if I'm creating a blog on my own website, I'll write in a certain way. And if I'm creating a blog for the JetBrains website, I'll write in a slightly different way. So ask about the corporate voice and brand and make sure you understand that. Next one, understand what the expectations are. So find out about, about the expectation for your contributions. And so how often, how often are they going to be expecting you to contribute content? Is it in the blog format? Is it videos? Is it tweets? What is it that they're expecting you to do and how quickly are they expecting you to create this content? So thinking about how you should be or how you can fit it into your day-to-day -day schedule. Um, learn about the review process. So this one is critical and this will be where most people um, get a bit blocked. You will have stakeholders who want to review content and should. You will have stakeholders that want to review content and shouldn't. You will have stakeholders that should review the content but don't want to. And you're going to have to manage those three groups of, st of stakeholders and understand what their schedule looks like, how they like to consume the content. Do they want it bite sized? Do they want it all in one hit? Are they good for what they say? Are they actually going to turn the, um, the review around on the timescales that you need? How does that all work? So find out. Promotional strategy. So is it going to be on the company to promote it or is it going to be on you to promote it? So I've worked for companies that, much to my disdain, 
turned around and said, well, we want you to use your personal LinkedIn channel to promote this. And I said, but it's my personal LinkedIn channel. I don't really want to, thank you. So find out what their promotional strategy is. You may be editing it, you may be writing it, you may be a guest, um, guest speaker on it, but find out if they're expecting you to promote it as well, or whether it's gonna be the company that'll be handling the promotional side of things. Right, last hack, uh, look behind you. So chat to people who've done this before, right? Unless you're working for a brand new startup, you are going to be working with people who have already contributed this content to the blog or YouTube or wherever. Learn from their experience. What was tough? What sucked? What worked? What do you need to watch out for? Because they've, they've been through it and they will know all the, all the pain points that you, know, you experienced. So yes, it is great for your company visibility. So when you're creating personal content, it's great for your own brand and your professional repertoire of skills. But also when you are creating um, content for a business, this is not a luxury most technical writers have, but if you're creating you know, your contribution to the blog, your name will be on it. And that's really good. That's really good for your, um, for your career, both in that company and when you move on. So those are a bunch of links. I hope the QR code works, but if it doesn't, um, my apologies. It worked yesterday, but who knows? I will share that um, those links with yourself, Nick, so you can put them somewhere for people to access them. I am hoping to turn this whole talk into a blog, one blog, maybe a series of blogs, not really sure yet, over the coming couple of weeks. Um, so that'll be on my website, which is helenjoescott.com. And other than that, thank you very much. And I shall stop sharing and hopefully stop talking. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Yeah, I suppose, uh, has anybody got any questions? If they want to kind of, yeah, everyone's doing a round of applause there, a little virtual, which is great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Definitely deserved. Um, I think I'll kick us off with a question if that's all right, just to kind of uh, get us moving. So, well, not necessarily a question, more an observation. So, like, uh, there's loads of great hacks there, but I think. The one that really jumps out to me is that experience-based content. Um, yeah. I think, I don't know if there's one thing I've, I've learned as well over the years is that if it's your experience, like you said, it can't be wrong, can it? And it's a really good place to no. start, you know, no. it's, with what you did. You know, it's through, such a good place to start. Yeah, yeah. It's also, I think, I think sometimes as well, when you're creating content and you're new to it, you think that a negative experience won't be as useful. And actually, they're more useful because if you tried something and you banged your head against the wall for five days on it and it's still not working and you write that up and you write up all the steps, you didn't fail, right? The tool or whatever, it, it was failed. And if you share your experience, the chances that you are that you will get a whole bunch of other people coming on, on board or sharing or commenting and saying, oh my God, the same happened for me. I thought it was just me. Yeah. And it just takes one person to go, yeah, this, this doesn't work. I just don't understand this. And it, it does, it takes an inner confidence to do that, to be able to go, yeah, I, it doesn't work. Um, but once you do that, the chances are the community will pile on and go, yeah, it didn't work for me either. <laughs> so experience is just insanely valuable. Yeah, for sure. I've got a question from Ryan. Hey, that was absolutely fantastic. I thought it was you know, really you. well presented. Uh, one of the the kind of the hacks which I'd like to know a little bit more about, if possible, is uh, it's the uh, uh, information density. So I think it was number eight. So information yep. density is a good thing. Yep. I just wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. You know, how can you actually achieve that? Is that including links to you know? other sources of information is that you know like uh, going yes. in your own content what what is that so it's it's come about so it's it's a kind of term that we use a lot in technical writing as well because when you're when you're consuming content we all consume content differently so some of us like to read from top to bottom and we just like to read the content on the page some of us like to read a paragraph and then find out more about a concept in that paragraph. So information density is about giving the reader a different reading path, if you like. So if you put links in that first paragraph, let's say you've introduced Spring Boot, I don't know, and you've put 
you then link to that concept and you then say also there's a bunch of other really good um, starter tutorials for Spring Boot at the bottom of um, at the bottom of this blog. So you give the reader a choice, you give them more options to explore at their pace because it's if you think about it from an, uh, an algorithmic point of view, you've got breadth and then you've got depth. And some readers like the breadth, they like to just stay at one level and they like to consume the content. But some readers like to go for the depth. So they'll start here and then they'll go down here, and they'll come up here, then they'll go along here, and they'll go down here. And it's about giving them the path to, to do the depth. It's about giving them somewhere else because you, you, we've all done it. We've all Googled something. We've probably just done something really innocent, like read you know, read the news and then half an hour has gone by and we have no idea where it went, but somehow we're on a completely different website. We're probably on Reddit at some point, you know, learning about this thing that we never even realized we wanted to learn about. So it's about giving the reader or the listener or the consumer more choice. I think information depth or information density is, is easier in blogs because you can use links. I think for videos, it's probably one of the hardest mediums to do it in, but you can at least um, verbally say there's more information and you can put more information in the YouTube comments. Um, podcasts, again, normally the, the podcast host has a way of putting a bunch of links at the end for you to consume. So it's about anything else that you think the reader might find useful. Did that answer your question? That's a, clearly, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Great. Cheers. Any um, other questions from anybody? I see my ex colleagues are being suspiciously silent. Uh -huh. Hi. Hello. Hello. How are Hello. you? Hello. I'm good. Thanks. Thank you very much for adding that bit for me, especially for me. Yeah. I thought so it was really helpful. And I found very interesting that the bit where you mentioned the language barrier or so on or however you want to call it because I think that that's a main thing for me as well I'm always nervous about that to get something wrong to say the wrong thing to use the wrong grammar to use the wrong accent I'm always aware of that and I always have that in the back of my mind never regardless of what I'm doing I'm talking in a meeting I'm writing something I'm always just like a, a bit too scared for that and I, I it happens many times that I get it wrong but I guess it's just I have to let it go. Like I'm, I'm sure I've said to you on a number of occasions, it's when a native speaker has any kind of English problem or English grammar question, we don't ask ourselves those questions. We ask people like yourself who've had to learn English as a second language because you know way more about the structure of English than native speakers do. So, yeah. you know, really try and remember that because yeah. it's so important. And yeah, don't let it hold you back. Yeah. Great, great talk, and good to see you. Uh, you too, Aurora. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Most decent people have got a lot of time for um, people who, where English isn't their native language. You know, have and... I have so much respect for it because I, I just, I, I, so I can't do it. I don't speak Spanish particularly well, um, My English and is sometimes terrible. I don't speak English very well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, if it's. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's a fantastic thing to do, and I definitely like to see um, like to see more more speakers who you know don't have this stupid British accent because it's boring. Um, Is there anything else from anybody? Um, I have a, I've got a question. Cool. Uh, I gave a presentation a few days ago, uh, and I got a feedback that I have got a lot of content on one side. Do you have any advice on that? If whenever we are preparing uh, slides and content, so what, uh, yeah, what should we keep in mind for that? Okay, so the, the top level answer is it depends, but the good news is, so everybody has a different style. So for example, today, I, I think my presentation ran to about 30 minutes. Um, I had 37 slides, right? There are some presenters out there who would have gone oh my God, Helen, you're an idiot. What are you doing? But because I like to move my slides on quickly and I like to have very little information on the slides, it works for my style. That doesn't mean to say it would work for your style or anybody else's. 
if you're getting feedback that you have too much stuff on one slide, just put it on more slides and move through them quicker. Um, a habit, and I know, I know I did this in the presentation I just gave, you're not supposed to read the same content that is, um, that is on the slides, but sometimes when it's just, you know, a hack and it's one sentence, and that's all I want, you know, the listener to take in, I think it's okay. But if you've got a lot of text on a slide, you might be getting that feedback because we as humans can't read and listen. We are biologically incapable of it. So your readers, uh, your listeners want to read your slides because the brain is saying text, I must read, but they also want to listen to you. So that might be why, you know, you got that feedback. And maybe if you, if you can split it up and talk more about what's on the slides rather than having it on the slides. And if it's reference stuff, you could put it at the end. Um, but it is it really is about experimenting and what works for you, because there are some presenters out there who have really information dense slides and they do it very well. But there's some I, I am definitely a more slides sort of presenter. I like the slides and I like moving them on quickly, but that's taken me about seven months to figure out that that's my style. So I would say just split the information across a few more slides, do a bit more talking around them um, and see how that goes down. But whatever hack it was, feedback, it's still your prerogative. It's still your choice. If it, if it works for you, and you know that you're not getting that feedback from every single person that you're ever giving that talk to, then you don't need to change it necessarily. You don't actually need to change it in the same way that sometimes I get told that I talk too fast. Would I like to change that? Maybe yes, but equally I'm quite high energy and I do tend to go quite fast, but I also acknowledge that maybe people for English is not their first language. I don't want to lose them. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. So I, I would experiment and I just give the give the talk to, you know, someone in your family or a pet and just see how you feel about splitting it out across a few slides. And if that doesn't work, try something else. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, there's um, another hack, which um, I think is a community mental one. So I, I kind of think that's really interested and useful one mm. as well and um i just like to say i think you mentioned it but you know places like our community the manchester java community i'm i'm somebody yeah. who would love to kind of help other people kind of get started where they can exactly also, I, think, I think i spotted it on your links there was a link to recworks and their meet a mentor mm -hmm. kind of so yes. we're sponsored by recworks this meetup so we've we've right. you know, definitely if people are looking for mentors yep. as a whole I think it's a Slack group, isn't it? Where they kind of, they match you up. Yes. Say you've got an interest. It might not be content creation. It might be just some kind of more technical yeah. topic, but they will meet, match you up with somebody who can help you. Uh, it's yeah. it's so valuable. Yeah. I've got, yeah, I've got a huge amount of value of it um, out of that. It's been, um, it's been very instrumental actually in my career recently to to have a chat with mentors. And equally, I've, I've picked up a couple of mentees as well. So that's, that's been a very, interesting learning journey because they're they're not mentees for java because i you know that's not where i am i'm at in my career but they're mentees for content creation which is something that i feel i can be very authentic about and have a lot of experience in so i'm learning about myself as well as i'm going through both being mentored and mentoring others so it's a really nice yeah. two-way relationship it's amazing how much you learn isn't it, when people ask you hard questions about their career yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely. isn't it just? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it really is. So yeah, yeah. No, no. So, I, I think we'll share all those links when we via the. Um, yeah, the, I'll the I'll send you across the summary slide now. Um, and I, I am hoping to, I want to turn it. I want to, therefore, it will happen. I'm going to turn it into. I said I told my manager I was going to turn it into a blog post, and she said, "Oh, I think that's more of a series of blogs, Helen." I'm like, hmm, maybe you have a good point. Um, <laughs> But I think she knows me far too well in that this started off with seven and is now 25. So maybe a series of blogs is, is a good idea. So, yeah. And then, of course, people people uh, ask me questions and I'm out thinking, hmm, content on slides. So thanks for that one, Serbi. Really appreciate that. I might add that one. <laughs> 
Um, I see uh, Lars has put the link to the Hemingway app in the chat as well. It's right. a good shout. I haven't, I haven't used that recently, but it is a good shout. And I think, is it free? I think it's free. Do you know if that one's free? Yes, it is free. Um, so yeah, that's another good shout. I, 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 I will caveat that one, that one slightly in that we all have our I'm completely web based. Okay, uh, we all have our own ways of writing and creating content. And again, because I've been a technical writer for so long, up until fairly recently, you have to be quite robotic when you're a technical writer. You have to write in a you have you have to follow the company brand and voice, right? And it's quite boring, usually. Sorry, all past employers. Um, but when you start to create your own content, you can be more flexible. You can be more yourself. And sometimes I'll run my stuff through Grammarly and it will go, oh, I don't like that. And I don't like the grammar. And you've got a dangling proposition and don't start a sentence with but. And I won't change it because it's me. It's my style of communication. It's how I like to write. And I... I'm not, I don't need to write full, proper, grammatically correct English all the time in my personal blogs. Obviously, if it was for a work blog, I'd change it. But from a personal perspective, I don't tend to get quite so hung up on that stuff anymore because we, I like to write how I speak and I like to write in a more natural and a more flowing way. And if, if we took a direct transcript of how I'm talking to you today and we put that into Hemingway app or Grammarly or whatever, it would absolutely freak so th there's a middle ground, I think. Awesome. Um, so I suppose we've got 20 past one, so people might want to be getting lunch, but I'll just check if there are any other, yeah. um, are there any other questions before we... Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a question if you don't mind. Right, so go. Um, do you think we've gone too far in the direction of having a, 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 a brand, if you like, you know, it, it's when I first started reading blogs and all that sort of thing, you, you sort of expected it to be a bit amateurish. And, but now it's like, like you're saying, you, you've got to make a brand. It's got to look professional. You've got to worry for typos and that sort of stuff. Um, have we gone too far? So I think with regards to making a brand, for me, I'm giving that advice because it's good it's good for yourself. Forget everybody else. Right? It's good for yourself because I want to look back on my website in 10 years time and I want to A, cringe and B, be really proud of myself. So I think from that perspective, that's why I feel so strongly about making a brand. There is an element of other people are doing it, therefore you'll get left behind if you don't, definitely. With regards to how polished your content should and shouldn't be, again, it depends how you're how you're creating it when you're creating it so i want to one of my personal goals is to get better at screwing up so when i'm okay get better at publicly screwing up i screw up loads in private but get better at publicly screwing up so when i'm giving a talk or when i'm giving doing a screencast even professionally be able to say oops i didn't mean to type that rather than going into camtasia and editing out the bit of code that i typed wrong which is what i do now so we're all human and I think if we can show that human aspect, whether that's through writing how we speak or not perhaps editing out all our all our mistakes, then I think there's definitely value in that. Uh, I don't know if we've gone too far or whether we're just we're just kind of changing and flexing as a community. But I from the stats that I've seen and the metrics that I've I've looked at, perfect bunny is content doesn't actually do that well like human content with a human connection that is authentic and maybe has the odd error in especially when when it's content that you are creating personally that content is the stuff that actually does better because if your content is really sanitized and really perfect um sometimes you lose that authenticity and you lose that human uh connection so that i think can be a little bit more challenging so I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, sort of. <laughs> yeah, I feel like a sort of as well. I feel like I'm circling around it, but not quite yeah, got I, to it. Yeah. I don't know if it's a, a difficult balance to make. Um, I, I've seen quite a lot of stuff where you definitely get the impression that people are doing it to make a brand rather than putting out interesting content for people to look at. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, 
not I'm not on board with that and I don't really see the point of it because why would you make a brand if you're not going to put out interesting content I, I, I don't really understand that um, which is why I say when when I recommend make a platform make a brand don't go down a brand rabbit hole just don't just pick some colors that look good and it's it is a it's a repository right it's a it's a personal git repository that's what your brand is it's it's everything that is you so all my website is is my bio because i don't want to have to copy and paste it recordings of talks that i give like this one and my blogs that's it that's all i put on there and if people want to consume it that's great and if they don't that's fine too it's it should be about interesting content that people get value from it should not be about i've got the most shiniest brand and i haven't seen much of that in the tech community i there's a lot of interesting content i haven't seen much kind of look at my flashy brand stuff but maybe i'm not looking in the same places i'm not sure uh the, the, the ljc had a talk last year and it was it, only one but it was really obvious that that was the case um oh, okay. i think the talk, the talk was scheduled for an hour but it only lasted about 30 minutes or so and then right yeah, i think it was quite obvious when the questions came in that yeah there, there was a gap <laughs> okay must have missed that one um yeah i totally copped out and used my used jet brains branding because i'm too lazy to create my own brand so i guess that yeah, tells I, you everything you need to know <laughs> well, me, me personally anyway I'd, I'd, I'd rather have somebody on who isn't maybe the best speaker but has something interesting to say rather than somebody who is good Absolutely. at speaking but doesn't have anything interesting yep. to say exactly no i completely agree with you it's it's about it's about that community participation it's about sharing those experiences and it's about learning from each other and one of the best ways we can do that is to is to share our content in whatever form that takes and it certainly doesn't have to be polished as far as i'm concerned there's probably typos all over my website Go check. <laughs> someone did pull me up on one the other day actually so. <laughs> oh, uh, actually another question how much how much of your personality should you expose because i mean i've got a pretty dark sense of humor but that's a good question yeah um i think this goes back to the authenticity piece so i i think i probably do expose a fair bit of my personality when i'm giving these talks um i'd like to think i do anyway what i don't tend to do is um, if it's if it's kind of my um, my my family or my other half, I'll properly swear at them. I don't tend to do that in talks or on Twitter, as a rule. I have done sometimes, but I tend to try and um, temper that aspect of my personality. But in terms of in terms of everything else and how I like to speak and how I like to write, I don't really filter that on my website. I make sure that I'm not putting a barrier higher for people whose English is not their first language. I don't write in such an obscure way that I think other people might not be able to understand it properly. Uh, and I like to think when I'm giving a talk like this that I'm I'm professional and polite, but equally, you know, I use words like fricking. So <laughs> I I think some of my personality does come across, but I definitely there's some of it that I don't um, I don't put out there for public consumption equally. Unless, of course, we get to meet up and there's a bar and pizza, in which case that probably be more of my personality, but yeah. six months' time. Great. Well, thanks, thanks everyone for... Um, Cheers, Craig. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. It's a good little group. Had some good discussions. Um, thanks to RecWorks for sponsoring today. And obviously, most importantly, thanks to Helen for joining us and delivering a yeah. great talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving up your lunch hour um, and a special shout out to my uh, my ex colleagues. I see you all there. So hello. And I hope you're all doing really well. So yeah, thank you to everyone. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. See you again soon. Cheers. Hello. Bye. Cheers, bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. bye. bye.